I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Clint Burnham, professor of English at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, where he also teaches theory and popular culture. He is one of the facilitators of Lacan Salon, and his most recent book is Does the Internet Have an Unconscious? Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T R A P A R T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Uh, Hey, Vanessa. It's uh, great to join you here from... um uh, Vancouver on the west coast of uh, North America and uh, it is in the morning here and it's nighttime where you are. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, the Rendering Unconscious uh, podcast. Uh, I guess I listened most recently to your the uh, interview with Sheldon George who's awesome. His book Trauma and Race is just uh, so good. Uh, I heard him uh, speak a couple of years ago at the LAC conference in uh, in Worcester, Mass, Worcester, Massachusetts, and um, also uh, when you had Danny Novus on back uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I mean, he's such a uh, he's such a uh, an exciting guy to listen to, um, and his uh, especially when uh, I really liked how he was critical of some of the orthodoxy around uh, Lacanians at that point that, well, the pandemic doesn't change anything about how we think about Lacan and psychoanalysis and so on. And, uh, you know, that was a defense mechanism, obviously, because the pandemic gave them anxiety, I think, because, you know, now they couldn't be in a room with their patients anymore. Um, But uh, yeah, so I I like the podcast a lot. Uh, It's really important uh, what you're doing, uh, getting all these interviews out, so many more, obviously, as well. So I look forward to our discussion today. I look forward to it too. And definitely Danny is always entertaining, highly entertaining. And Sheldon, literally when I hung up with Sheldon, I thought I'm in love. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's my first thought. He's just amazing. Yeah. He's such a nice guy. um, And uh, like as a person kind of thing, but uh, also it's, uh, you know, the work he's done is, uh, is super important. So uh, yeah, it's cool. It's changing the discourse. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I want to come back and talk about questions of decolonizing Lacan a bit later, or decolonizing psychoanalysis, because that's where the exciting action is these days, I think. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, there need, need to be more, both more uh, voices of, uh, of Black analysts, analysts of color, and so on, in, in mainstream psychoanalytic and Lacanian uh, discourse. Uh, but also, there needs to be a reckoning and thinking about what uh, psychoanalysis can both offer uh, thinking about race and racial trauma and so on, but also what it can learn from it. And I think that uh, there's been lots of stuff people have been doing around, um, you know, be, with the sort of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd uh, protests over the past uh, four months. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to keep happening. Yeah, and the other area you talk a lot about is technology. And I think these two areas, technology and decolonizing psychoanalysis, those are like really important, I think, right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with, I, I want to, I was thinking about the technology thing, I mean, in particular, because how it's affected, first of all, before we talk about my work per se, I want to talk about a sort of collective that I'm a part of the Lacan Salon here in Vancouver. 
Uh, and so we've been meeting like since oh, 2007, uh, sort of started uh, by Hilda Fernandez, who's an analyst, and Paul Kingsbury and myself. And Paul and I both teach at the local university, Simon Fraser University, and he's a geographer and I work in literature. But so it started then and it would, we've been meeting every two weeks since then, since like so for 13 years now. And, uh, but, you know, we would get a dozen people, 20 or a bit more if on a, on a good day. I mean, Vancouver is not a huge city. Um, and uh, academics, poets, artists, students, and so on. We've had these conferences and that. But now all of a sudden with, uh, when we got hit by the pandemic, first of all, we're like, oh, well, we should still keep trying to do things. But then of course, everything shut down. The lockdown happened at the middle of March here in uh, Vancouver. And uh, so we started doing it on Zoom and we weren't sure how that was going to work. But I mean, the last couple we started, uh, you know, we went through until the end of July. Then we started again uh, at the beginning of September. And our first two sessions, we've had like 40 to 50 people and it's from around the world, which is super cool. So we get, I mean, it's 7 p.m. here. So I think it's in the middle of the day, like in New Zealand and Australia. And we get people from there. Uh, and we get people from the East Coast of the U.S. Sometimes there's people from the U.K., which seven here is like, you know, eight hours later there. So it's like whatever, I can't even do the math, three in the morning or something. Yeah. But uh, so the technology has, uh, you know, and that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, in any kind of discussion around uh, uh, surveillance and technology and online media and all those sort of things is that on the one hand, these things are offering tremendous opportunities both for uh, a kind of uh, uh, making ideas and texts and images accessible to a lot of people who wouldn't have had access before because of uh, whether it's uh, social conditions or lack of uh, educational uh, institutions and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, I mean, I want to get really critical about it, but I also want to keep in mind that, you know, obviously the internet is an amazing technological innovation and, it, you know, it. Uh, like other media in the 20th century, television and radio and film, it really uh, offers a, a whole lot of uh, utopian possibilities, even while it's still obviously going to be used by the state and so on. So yeah, that's so that the but the way in which the salon then became this kind of um, small scale uh, but also global um, uh, entity is kind of cool. It's kind of exciting. Uh, but I have been thinking about the relationship between psychoanalysis and uh, digital technology for a while. Um, my book, Does the Internet Have an Unconscious? Uh, Slavoj Žižek and Digital Culture came out in 2018 uh, from Bloomsbury. Um, and I've been sort of working on that for the past, the previous sort of seven or eight years. Um, and my kind of working through line is we need psychoanalysis to understand the internet but we also need the internet to understand psychoanalysis. Um, so people have used psychoanalysis, obviously a lot of people have drawn on psychoanalysis to talk about film. That's been uh, arguably the most important uh, application, if you will, of psychoanalytic theory for the past 40 or 50 years since the great screen moment in the 1970s, uh, you know, development of the ideas of the imaginary signifier with Christian Metz or, uh, the Male Gaze uh, by Laura Mulvey, which we'll come back to. Um, and then more recently, since the 90s, uh, with the work of, of Zizek, but especially Joan Kupchak, um, and then Todd McGowan, um, around thinking around film. So uh, that's gone on a lot, and that's very important. And those theories of the gaze and of the screen and so on are, are very important in our current moment, too, for thinking about uh, all the video conferencing <laughs> that we're doing, all the Zoom or or MS Teams or Skype still, people are still doing that. All those different interfaces that we're uh, working with that offer the voice and the visual at the same time and seem to be two way and have all these problems and have all these fetishes associated with them. So I hope to, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit later too. But, uh, but uh, so for me, it was like, well, but what is that, what about the internet? What about digital culture? And, um, and this became something, I guess I just started thinking about and um, thinking about uh, different theories of the unconscious. So, um, you know, Freud's notion of the unconscious as some kind of a disavowal or negation. And in the book, I talk about uh, sort of Scandinavian noir uh, novels in terms of this. Uh, 
you know, not just uh, the girls of dragon tattoo, but there's a whole kind of you know genre, of course. And it's just one uh, novel where uh, this guy is getting all these emails accusing him of a crime. Uh, and it turns out that the emails are coming uh, from a computer in his basement. And so that's like, that is like the unconscious <laughs> It is the idea, you know, so all our ideas of, uh, and that's a Lacanian idea of the unconscious too, because for Lacan, the unconscious is not just interior or below us in depth in that kind of Freudian model, but it's also exterior or extimate. It's something outside of us. Uh, so it's social. So in the way the, the internet itself is our unconscious, perhaps in some kind of ways, it's where all these things that we don't want to think about uh, take place, um, what Slavoj Žižek calls the obscene underside. So there's the official internet, you know, of face, well, Facebook has been discredited in the past few years, obviously, but for a while it was seen as being quite sort of important, or, or Google, or Amazon, and so on, the corporate or government uh, or cultural institutions. And then there's this obscene underside, whether it's the hackers or trolls, or one example I talk about in my book as well is, um, uh, this phenomenon from the first decade of the 21st century of uh, uh, sort of Nigerian spam or 419 spam, uh, where they would, you get these uh, elaborately written sometimes emails sent to you. Uh, my cousin is a prince and he was in a, a plane accident and there's just $10 million that we have to get out of the country. All we need for you to do is to open this account and we'll put the money in there. And you just put a bit of money in there at first and then you'll get this 10 million, you get this million dollars or what have you. Um, and this whole genre of, and you know, in an interesting kind of way of thinking about, um, of uh, sort of like a, a third world kind of uh, 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 stealing back money from the colonizer uh, kind of model. Uh, it, it was also a genre or a kind of a, an internet spam thing that, that led to and helped the development of the Nigerian inter, uh, internet uh, system. In the same way people say in the 1990s in, in America at least, uh, it was porn that helped to develop the uh, AOL and all the kind of a computer infrastructure because people were downloading these, it would take forever to get one sort of photograph sort of to download. This is before your time, but um, and I'm sure oh, you I remember. <laughs> you remember, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, they're, 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 you know, and uh, you know, dial up modems, all that kind of moment. Um, and that, so the, that uh, obscene underside was what uh, led to the development of that technology, you know, the demand for it. And the same way in Nigeria, it was all these internet cafes, which again are a thing, we, if we think about 20 years ago, they were these kind of hipster places in, in the developed world. But in Nigeria is where these gangsters would run these teams of guys writing all this elaborate kind of uh, spam. So thinking about, thinking about some of, the, some of those um, uh, aspects of um, uh, the internet in terms of ideas um, of the unconscious, uh, you know, the, the digital, it's universal and it's utopian and it's libidinal. So, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to the uh, sort of libidinal. Um, um, you know, so uh, Lacan talks about the uh, uh, latuses and the aliospheres. So the latus are the gadgets that people have an affection for. He started talking about these in the late sixties. And the aliosphere is this idea of there being something out there. And so these are uh, concepts that are very much uh, amenable to thinking about uh, the internet and our, and our digital devices uh, themselves. And you think of your, you know, your phone, I mean, where do you put it? You put it in your pocket next to your genitalia or you put it in your purse next to your money. I mean, it, it has, and it's, it, it's what in psychoanalysis is called a phallic object, you know, like a car uh, or, or a fancy house or something. It's something we want people to admire, you know, and even the way, you know, we, we take these pictures, we hold the phone up, um, and or you know even with the selfie stick as a kind of a gadget for a gadget, uh, so there's a very libidinal attachment that we have uh, um, with these um, with these objects themselves. So I talk about that in the book. I talk about thinking about um, uh, Zizek as an internet philosopher, uh, both in terms of his method of writing. You know, there's that famous scene in the in the first documentary on him. Uh, where he is, uh, he says he just, he, he never writes, he just takes notes and then he puts them together uh, and then they become, uh, you know, a book or something. Uh, so it's like kind of like a collaged or mashup sort of a cut and paste um, approach, a very digital kind of approach. 
Um, and of course, the way, I mean, it's not, and it's not only uh, Zizek, but it certainly was for a while, his dissemination through YouTube and so on, as well as all the different, you know, memes and uh, Twitter accounts, and all that sort of ways in which philosophy and, or cultural uh, theory uh, these days quite often does circulate in that kind of modality um, and his kind of notoriety happening because of that. Uh, I think about, so uh, even, but I, but I, just like, uh, you know, Freud when in, and I'll just compare myself to Freud, why not? <laughs> but just like, you know, Freud would look at, uh, you know, these things that are, that we dream about or these mistakes that we make or these jokes that we tell. And he found in those, uh, the structures for how the unconscious works, for how subjectivity works. And we can think of very minor um, aspects of, um, of the internet, like the little phrase, LOL. Uh, you know, laugh out loud. And so the, the question, I take it very seriously, the question I asked, is it a matter of uh, jouissance or is it a matter of interpassivity? So laugh out loud is like, well, what would be the alternative? <laughs> you know, so I laughed out loud just now. I mean, laughing silently, you know, it's a weird sort of doubling down on the idea of laughter. Um, but then it you know, ends up as this little signifier, the letters LOL. Um, and uh, so is it, is, it, is it a sign of a kind of unbearable uh, laughter uh, in the way that uh, uh, Lacan would talk about jouissance, that it's a, a kind of this laughter that sort of is very intense in a certain kind of way? Um, or is it, uh, is it an example of what, uh, what uh, the Austrian philosopher Robert Fowler, and Zizek picks up on this as well, calls interpassivity? So interpassivity is a critique of the, the sort of uh, trend in the 1990s to talk about computer technology and so on in terms of interactivity, unlike a book or a film with, with computer tech, with computer narrative, you can go in there and change the story. You're, you're interacting with the story. And uh, Fowler and then Zizek, Zizek said, no, of course not. Uh, actually, it's not so much that you're acting with it. It's a matter that you're passive with it or that steel is your passivity. Um, so when we write LOL, is that so that we don't have to laugh ourselves? The LOL does the laughing for us. Um, and this goes back to a, uh, a famous example that Lacan uh, gives in uh, Seminar 7, the Seminar on the Ethics of Psychoanalysis, when he's talking about um, uh, Greek tragedy and Antigone, and he says, you go to the, he gives this great kind of anachronistic example where he says, you go to a performance uh, and uh, you think you have to have, you have to have some feelings, some emotions, but really uh, you're distracted by uh, the check you have to write or where did you leave that pen? So he uses as though he's not talking, he's not pretending to be talking about Greek tragedy in uh, ancient Greece. He's talking about going to a play now in the 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, referring to a pen or a check you have to write. But then he says, don't worry about it, the, uh, about having any kind of emotions. The chorus will have their emotions for you. So Zizek has riffed on that, talking about laugh tracks for uh, television shows, for sitcoms. I mean, they laugh because you get home from work and you're too tired to actually laugh at Seinfeld or something. But, you know, the laugh track does the laughter for you. So in the same way, the LOL does the laughing for you. So it's interpassive or maybe it's uh, issuissance. Um, a couple other kind of examples or thinking about this that I was, uh, I've been drawing on more recently. And, you know, of course, with uh, uh, COVID and the pandemic and the lockdown, there's been this sort of explosion of uh, food delivery services, not just Uber Eats, but there, like there's one in, in my country called Skip the Dishes, um, you know, and uh, which is, which is, which even the phrase of it is the, the title, skip the dishes, i.e. you order out and you don't have to do the dishes, um, is on the one hand, a reminder that with uh, the pandemic, there's so much more waste being generated again, gloves and masks and takeout containers and so on. Uh, but it's also that it doesn't matter what the food is like, as long as you don't have to clean up, that's the important thing. Food, you know, food is really a drag, cooking it for yourself is really a drag because then you have to clean up. At any rate, these uh, the skip the dishes. Uh, they had these billboards, and they, they give great examples of how libidinally we're, we're sort of tied into our to uh, the digital. And one of them said, "For when your hot pick goes to dad instead of Dan." So it's the idea that you've sent this text of yours, this uh, sex of yourself, this picture of yourself, uh, semi-nude or something, or with some kind of ribald uh, comment. And uh, instead of it going to uh, your partner, Dan, it goes to your father, dad. Um, so of course, there's a, a, a aspect of the Freudian spiff, a parapraxis there. You type 
typed out D-A-D instead of D-A-N, although who would do that? Like it doesn't really work as a practice because you just click on the sort of, at any rate. Um, and, uh, but of course, then why is it that your boyfriend's name is so close to the name for your father? would be, you know, would be the next question, right? What, which is to say the incest taboo. Um, or another one that they give is uh, another one of these uh, skip, your dish, skip the dishes uh, billboard ads said, for when your text about Barb goes to Barb. So again, it's the idea that, okay, we're texting some snarky comment and we send it to the person that it was about rather than to our friend and so on. But even there, it's like, what did you really want? Perhaps you wanted Barb to know about your text. And, and, and there's a couple more layers too. I mean, I could go on all day about this one example, because on the one hand, it's actually, that's my mother's name. Barb is my mother's name. So there's that kind of thing. But also, of course, the, uh, this only works if the text itself is barbed. That is to say, if the text itself has some kind of a snarky comment in it, we think of barbed wit and so on. So there's, a, there's these, these you know, common little advertising kind of slogans that are drawing on the, our everyday uses and misuses of technology have a lot to, uh, to, uh, to interpret in them. And finally, of course, they're saying this, this food delivery service is for when you've had a bad day. So food as a kind of a comfort object, obviously. Um, but you, then you think back to uh, our digital devices, they, off, they are also some kind of oral comfort object. Uh, on Facebook or on Twitter, we talk about our feed. Okay, so it's like it's feeding us. Uh, in Instagram, if you put up a picture of uh, your cute cat or something, uh, or maybe, you know, some young guy takes, puts, a, puts a picture of himself with, without a shirt on and that, right? These are called thirst traps. So, which is to say that you're thirsty for attention. So, you know, there's a, an interesting kind of layering uh, that's sort of happening there. Um, so, so in, in the work that I've done both in that book and, and in articles I've, I've been writing uh, since then, it seems to me there's a lot, uh, again, that can be uh, learned about psychoanalysis by looking at the internet and a lot that can be learned uh, about uh, the internet by, by looking at it through a psychoanalytic um, lens. I'll give uh, a couple more uh, kind of examples of things I've been uh, writing about and, and talking about for the past couple of years. And one, this was a, an article that uh, I had on that uh, online quasi-academic uh, blog called The Conversation a couple of years ago. And it said, uh, all texting is sexting, which is to say, in our phone, we're sending a text to someone. It's also a, a call for love. It's also, we, we communicate in, in any kind of communication. This would be a, you know, a psychoanalysis 101 kind of argument. Any kind of communication is also about uh, the desire for affection. It's, you know, pay attention to me. I, I, I need to know, I need you to help me and so on, right? So it's a, it's a cry for love. Um, so, and texting, uh, no less so. And of course, like I said, again, we're doing it with our phones, which are these objects that we have, we already have as objects, these kind of, it cut off right when you was... said we're doing it with our phone these kinds of <laughs> objects and then it went <laughs> uh yeah there's you know there's a lot there with um you know i i i will I'll, I'll come to that as well or even talk about it right now in terms of uh the zoom lag or the zoom gap and so on and it's people talking over each other or uh, a student was saying the other day you know you wonder is your comment worth hitting the button to turn your mic on, you know, so it adds this extra kind of anxiety and uh, uh, mediation involved there, you know. Um, so of course, anything that fails is grist for the, for the Lacanian or for the psychoanalytic mill, right? Because that's a failure. Uh, we, you know, we blame ourselves or we get angry and frustrated and so on. Um, so it, uh, it provides ways for us to think about this. But yeah, getting back to texting and, and, uh, and sexting. I mean, there's been all, the, the reason why I wrote that article for the conversation was there's been all these, there was a, there was a local example in, in Canadian politics of a, of a conservative politician named Tony Clement, who it turned out was uh, basically what it seemed to be happening was he was, as one uh, woman put it, aggressively liking uh, women's photographs on Instagram. 
And a lot of them were, were, I mean, they were like, say, journalists, and they, you know, he was probably my age in his late 50s, and maybe they were uh, in their 20s or 30s or something. So there's that kind of, you know, morality play going on of, about age difference. Um, but I like the idea that it's called aggressively liking. So he would go into someone's Instagram feed and, you know, hit like on 10 or 20 of them all at once or in a row. Um, and of course, but, you know, again, it's, it's what in media theory uh, are called affordances of the interface that is to say to when you like something on instagram a heart shows up so it's already libidinal and you know you may just want to you know like i mean i have students who follow me or i follow on that you know and you want to have a professional relationship you just want to say you like their picture of their damn cat but all of a sudden you get caught up in this kind of you know improper sort of a uh, um, relationship right and so the the technology itself brings that to the fore. And that's why we have this mixed relation, a love-hate ambivalence, as Freud would call it, relationship with, uh, with that technology. Um, so that was the argument that I, and the other famous example, of course, with, uh, with sexting that's more uh, direct is uh, the US politician, Anthony Weiner, with a great name. <laughs> um, and there's a great documentary about him. Uh, you know, and he, he was, you know, sending pictures, he was sending dick pics, right? Uh, to other women and doing it, uh, you know, from his phone. And, uh, and it's like he had this kind of uh, insatiable sort of desire. And um, of course, in our, um, uh, our culture today, these are all, every, all those things are labeled as addictions, um, you know, a sex addiction, a, an internet addiction, and so on. Um, uh, but I think a more straightforward Lacanian thing would talk about them in terms of neurosis and uh, an obsession. Uh, in general, uh, but you know, if you uh, to to get back to the like sexting and texting, I mean, if you really again, the, you know, part of the argument could be that this is uh, not really anything new. The use of technology for these so-called improper purposes, and uh, in that article as well, I said if you want to see some really sexy texts, read uh, *Liaison Dangereuse* or *Dangerous Liaisons*, that French novel from 1782 by Pierre uh, uh, Chaudelarose de Lacos. A very, and it's a great film as well, and it's a very, you know, uh, a great portrayal of these decadent aristocrats, you know, writing letters back and forth and pretending they're written by somebody else and, and just as a, as a form of, uh, as a form of uh, aggression. Um, so I don't know, maybe, do, do we wanna talk more about technology stuff or do we wanna move on to, uh, to COVID? What's your, uh, what's your feeling here? Well, the one thing that since you're, you write about technology a lot that I've been thinking about that I haven't talked to anybody about yet is that um, when, when COVID started happening, so this bridges into COVID, everybody was very concerned about what it was gonna be like to work online or work remotely with patients, right? And then like Danny Nobis, for example, gave a talk with the Freudian Lacan, Freud Lacan Institute out of Ireland, um, where everybody was talking about this and, and talking about different ways in which they work with patients. Do you make them turn the screen off? Is it on? Like, is your screen on and their screen off and all these kinds of things that nice. the analysts were nice. worried about. But then I was thinking, um, even though usually we don't, we don't have face to face, I've been thinking about it. And like, usually when people are in this kind of process, they usually look at the little picture of themselves, right? And not at the other person. Like, let's be, admit, most people are looking at themselves talking, right? So like, yeah. what does that say about the mirroring or the other, or like, yeah. what, what do you think about yeah. that? Well, hopefully you're still recording, right? So we're talking about, okay. Yeah, cause I mean, I'll tell you how I, my hack is that right now, so I got the little green light at the top of my screen and I have just, I have, I have the image reduced. So it's just a picture of you right below that. So, and, and that's what usually what I do when I'm like in a meeting or something or when I'm talking uh, and I'm, you know, I've got uh, documents up and so on, but I don't, I mean, I don't want to get sucked into it because like everyone else, I'm very vain and narcissistic. And I don't want to keep looking at myself or worrying about, you know, is there something in my teeth or, or all the, all those kind of things are both the, the plus and the negative of looking at yourself to be sure. But yeah, I mean, I, I, let's think about this um, in terms of, uh, you know, the screen versus the mirror. So, uh, you know, Joan Kopchak uh, famously argues in her, her essay on the orthopsychic uh, subject, which is in uh, Read My Desire, uh, her first sort of major book from the 1990s. She says that rather the mistake that people back that film theory a moment I was talking about earlier, 
The mistake people made in the 1970s and the 1980s was to think that the screen was a mirror. So they would talk about film in terms of Lacan's uh, essay on the mirror stage, which is quite often for many uh, you know, college students, the only thing they read by Lacan, it's only eight pages long. I mean, it's super dense, like all of his writing, but that's all they get. You know, and they say, oh yeah, I identify with a mirror image. There you go, boom, done. Um, and, but rather she said, no, we should think about the mirror as a screen. That we should think about that when we when I see that image of myself in the Zoom call, the mirror image of me, and and the fact that actually it is the mirror image in that reflective sense too, that it's backwards. And if you had a T-shirt on, you the you, the, the the writing would be backwards and so on. Uh, that it's also a screen. It's a screen in a number of different ways. Um, you know, Freud talks about screen memories. So screen memories are things we th are sure that happened and they're, but they're actually screening us from something more traumatic to sort of deal with and so on. Uh, or we can think of, there's a famous, uh, another way of thinking about how screens function is I like it in Stanley Cavell's, uh, he has this great essay where he talks about the, uh, I think it's a Clark Gable or Cary Grant film called It Happened One Night. Uh, and it's like literally a traveling salesman joke of a film where uh, this traveling salesman and this woman, they end up having to share a motel room. And so they put up a sheet between the two beds. Um, and uh, Cavell talks about that sheet as being akin to Kant's distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal, that which we know and that which we can only know through our faculties. Um, but it's also a screen, it's a, it's a uh, self-referential or self-reflexive uh, moment on the part of the filmmaker to have the screen that is blocking us from what we see. So people are getting changed on either sides of the screen. So when I see that mirror image of myself on my screen, it's screening me from what I don't want to see in a certain kind of way as well. Um, but yeah, so some other ways I've been thinking about uh, uh, COVID um, and the pandemic and what we've been doing with it, both the, the everyday sort of things, hand washing or masks and so on, as well, especially the, our use of technology with, with Zoom and, uh, and what have you. Um, and I talked about this first one for a, a conference in in Paris. The highlight of my academic career, I was at a keynote conference in Paris, and of course I was just sitting here in my office uh, talking on Zoom. Uh, but it was in, in, in May at the uh, American University of Paris, and I, there's a, this whole theory of, uh, of uh, political sovereignty called the King's Two Bodies, uh, developed by Ernst Kantrovich in the 1950s, where he said in the medieval era, people distinguish between the physical body of the king and the royal body in a certain kind of way. You know, the king is dead, uh, long live the king sort of thing. Um, and uh, Zizek and so on have talked about this as well, but we can also think about this uh, with those images that started circulating uh, early in, in COVID of politicians giving a, giving a press conference and the press all being, you know, uh, two, two or three meters away with masks on. Um, there was famous ones of uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau doing this, uh, but they, they circulate all around the world. And so that's the, the leader's two bodies in the sense that he, he still is enough of a, of a leader that the, the, the journalists are going to be there to hear him say those words, but because his body may be infected with COVID or may be susceptible to be infected with COVID, then we have to have this kind of a distance. And this even goes, and you know, we're, everybody's reading all the, you know, the plague and pandemic novels, Boccaccio or Camus and so on. In Daniel Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year, uh, there's a scene there where the mayor stands on a platform to give a talk to the people and everyone has to be a certain sort of distance so that they don't sort of breathe the common air. That's how they thought the plague was, that the Black Death was spread. Of course, it was spread by fleas carried by uh, on rats or something, or that's the theory. At any rate, so that's the, this notion of the leader's two bodies or the king's two bodies is also an example of what Lacan would talk about in terms of the split subject. That we have our, we have our bodies, which we think, you know, fa Lacan famously says, I think it's in seminar uh, 19, you know, they think they have their bodies, but they're always escaping from them because that's, that's, that's what uh, our body is. With our body, we have what Lacan would call an imaginary relation. And so that's why your patients want to look at themselves on the screen because they want to, they, 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 it isn't enough to be in their body. They want to see their body. They want to have that image of their body. Um, but say masks, what do masks mean? And why are some people so upset with wearing a mask? 
uh, Todd McGowan has some great um, uh, YouTube videos he's been putting up where he talks about this. Um, so on the one hand, Lacan would say that the mask is our true subjectivity. He uses the metaphor of the mask at different points in, in his decree in particular. Um, and he says it's a true persona and the Latin word persona meant mask in the sense of what theater uh, performers would wear. Uh, Todd uh, talks about it as being like a, the mask is a fetish to cover up our lack. Uh, which is why it upsets people. He he makes. I think he, he. I'm not sure if I agree that it's it's necessarily a right wing thing. Although of course it is, right wing people around the world who are arguing against wearing masks for the most part, but not always. Not only, um, you know, the whole anti vaxxer COVID skeptic thing. You know, also in the Venn diagram overlaps with you know um, uh, liberal uh, parents and so on who who are worried about big government and all those kind of things. But uh, the other thing the mask means is it's a sort of a sign of our collectivity. When I wear a mask, it's because I don't want other people to be infected. So it's actually a mark of getting out of individualism, which is part of the, I have to say, you know, and, and I think many people would agree with this, that one good aspect of the pandemic has been this notion that people do care about others. And if not that we're all in this together because there are great economic uh, and social inequalities being brought to the fore by, uh, by COVID, but our awareness of those inequalities and of the importance of social distancing or physical distancing and so on, I think does have a, uh, a utopian aspect to it. But we also might want to think about masks in terms of all the different ways that people wear them incorrectly. You know, so on the chin or hanging off one ear or uh, up over one's eyes on the plane, that famous photograph of the Trump voter or um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a hole cut in it so you can uh, drink, your, uh, drink your drink and so on. So like those all indicate the ways in which the, the mask is this kind of fetish, but this fetish that we don't know quite what to do with in a certain kind of way. Or another uh, everyday activity from uh, during COVID, especially at the beginning, was the whole demand that we wash our hands. And the ways in which for, you know, in February and in March, there was all these memes going around and the, you know, the WHO posters showing you how to wash your hands. We had to learn how to wash our hands. We were infantilized by COVID. We didn't remember the basic thing that apparently children learn when they are two or three years old, but now had to be retaught to us, you know, and, you know, it, even to the extent that at, uh, uh, you know, at rock concerts when they were still happening, people were closing. I was literally at a show where they said at the end, remember to wash your hands. Like it was just, you know, and, and punk rock lyrics or hip hop lyrics were being set to those little, those WHO posters that show the whole, you know, nine or 10 little, little drawings of how to wash your hands and make sure you, you get in between all the fingers and so on and so forth. But uh, think about before COVID, what we would say about somebody who washed their hands, you know, a dozen times a day. We would call that a kind of obsession or a neurosis, an obsessional neurotic act. Um, uh, Larry David uh, on, uh, you know, curb your enthusiasm. He always had hand sanitizer everywhere, right? Um, so is it still now? And here we can think of, uh, and I'm, it's. Look, uh, Zizek claims that Lacan says this somewhere, but nobody's ever been, you know, I've asked Todd about this. No one's found where Lacan did say this. I think it's one of those examples of Zizek making something up and then claiming it's there in Freud or it's there in Lacan. But it's a good one anyway, which is that uh, Lacan says, uh, if you consider a pathologically jealous husband, even if his wife is objectively having an affair on him, he still is pathologically jealous. So in the same way, even if we do now have to wash our hands or we, we've learned that it actually is more necessary to help spread, uh, to help spread, to help stop the spread of COVID, it is still an obsessional act for us to be doing this in this time. Um, and I guess the other thing is to think that I'll, I'll sort of wrap up in terms of this, uh, the, the sort of COVID topic, is to think about Zoom and the gaze on the one hand and silence on the other. So we, if you think of, uh, of what happens with a, these video conferencing uh, interfaces and technologies or platforms, um, one, of the, one of the aspects that we're having trouble with right now is that nobody is looking each other in the eye. So we think we have this fantasy that the ways in which people in IRL, in real life, uh, or 
pre-COVID, that utopian time back in you know late 2019, um, that people had meaningful relationships by looking each other in the eye. But now, so I'm looking you in the eye right now, Vanessa, or I think I am, but of course you're seeing me looking just below the camera. Uh, and so there's never any kind of real possibility of looking at someone in the eye and them looking back at you at the same time. I think you're looking back at me, but that's because you're looking at the camera. Now I'm looking at the camera, so you think I'm looking at you. Um, so this whole problem that happens with, uh, with these video conferencing um, technologies where the camera is at one point and the image is somewhere else, um, it, on the one hand, it helps us, I think the reason why it's so troubling to us is it captures the real of the gaze for us. For Lacanian theory, the gaze is not that uh, common feminist idea that uh, developed in the 1970s from the work of Laura Mulvey in particular, which is that the, of the male gaze, which is that, uh, that film depends on or everyday life depends on this power that comes, it comes really out of Foucault more than uh, Lacan, like the Panopticon. Power comes from looking at somebody else. Um, and so women are arranged for men to look at, which isn't to say those things don't happen, but that isn't the gaze. That isn't how the gaze operates. Rather for Lacan, the gaze is some kind of a um, becoming aware that you're not being looked at. The famous, uh, he tells this famous anecdote, it's in uh, seminar 11 on the four fundamentals of psychoanalysis. Um, it's called the sardine can story. So uh, Lacan talks about how when he's in his 1920s and he was this sort of you know, burgeoning intellectual, he takes a vacation to, uh, uh, to the coast of France and he's going to go out with his fishermen and he's gonna be in this real life, masculine, working class, dangerous kind of uh, situation. And he's out in these boats. And uh, it, I think uh, Kopchak, when she talks about it, she says how Lacan refers to it as a petite histoire, a little story. Um, but there's also a character in there or uh, somebody he knows, a fisherman called Petit Jean. So this is a, a common sort of French appellation and quite often it'd even be T Jean, like T-I and then Jean. Uh, but the smallness is important to this as well because they're out on the ocean, you know, and he thinks it's gonna be some kind of Moby Dick kind of, uh, you know, macho kind of thing. But uh, actually it's a very beautiful day. It's very, it's very nice out. Um, and then at one point, uh, T Jean says, points out something in the, uh, sparkling in the water uh, and it's a sardine can floating there. Uh, and he says, you see that can, do you see it there? Well, it doesn't see you. <laughs> so this, uh, this working class guy is laughing at this effete, you know, Parisian intellectual who thinks he can be one of them, but he's not seen. That's the gaze. The gaze is not to be seen by the other. And so in some ways that, uh, that sardine can or Lacan in that situation is like the Zoom user that we're not seeing. That's what really upsets us and gives us the kind of Zoom fatigue in a certain kind of way is not being seen. So uh, that's one way to think about this. And this is again, is that Joan Kopchak idea of the mirror as a, as a, as a screen. But this was in some ways, you know, so you know, Kopchak was, was theorizing this in the 1990s, but even more recently, a lot of this in terms of the visual interface of, of the screen and so on, something that we look at and is looking at us at the same time, was sort of worked out for us in the uh, 2018 film Searching. Uh, which is one of those films which everything takes place on a computer screen. And you have this father, John, played by John Cho, who's searching for his daughter who goes missing. And of course, searching then is also, you know, has all these shots of uh, where he's typing in some word into Google or whatever, and, you know, and then different links come up and so on. So all those ways in which we look at screens. But there's also the, the keeps being these shots of uh, John Cho's captured by the camera like now, and you, but you can also see what's on his screen at the same time. So this flattening of the, the shot and the screen at the same time that we now see with Zoom or with share screen, think of you know, the ways in which that sort of operates um, as uh, these were sort of worked through in terms of the screen as also a mirror and the mirror as a screen in, um, in that film in searching. I recommend people go back and look at it. So the other way to think about that I've been thinking about this, uh, about Zoom, and I was in an email conversation with uh, Cindy Zeiher and uh, Ed Pluth, who have a really good book uh, called uh, On Silence, um, Holding the Voice Hostage. It's one of the Palgrave um, uh, Lacan series books. Um, uh, was about Zoom and, and silence. And thinking in particular, uh, if you're a lecturer and or a pro professor, a teacher, 
and you're giving your talk and there's, you know that students are there, maybe they're just those little black squares and maybe you can see their faces or so on. Maybe you have your PowerPoint up and you're narrating the PowerPoint and there's just kind of deafening silence that you're talking and you're not really sure how are things sort of, how is it getting through and so on. Which is to say, on the one hand, the silence then is kind of what an example then of what Lacan would call an object petit a, this little object uh, that, sort of, that sort of orients our desire. I want to hear my students. And isn't that funny that before, if we were giving a lecture, and you know, again, in pre-COVID times, if someone starts talking, you would think that was rude. And you would say, just wait and let me finish my sentence, or just let me finish this, this part of what I'm getting through, and then we'll have some questions. But now that they're not talking, that becomes an object. That becomes a, uh, a kind of a, a kind of an intrusion. Uh, and I guess the final thing that I would think about uh, around this and, and Zoom silence and, and so on, and this is uh, an example that uh, Stein Van Hul uh, talks about, I think it seems actually in his dissertation. Um, in, and his dissertation is talking about burnout. So we can think about Zoom fatigue or compassion fatigue or burnout, the ways in which we're, we're so tired at the end of the day from using all this sort of technology. But he gets a great, his dissertation is on a Lacanian reading of, of questions of, of burnout and so on. Um, and, uh, but he gives this example that uh, Lacan talks about, I, get, I think again, it's in seminar seven, uh, this uh, famous story about St. Martin and uh, uh, the beggar. Uh, so St. Martin was a, a Roman uh, soldier uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the Christian era, who uh, famously he comes across a, a beggar in the streets of Rome and he rips his cloak in half and gives the cloak to the beggar. And this is, you know, a, you know, a, a signifier of his, of his compassion. And Lacan asks, well, maybe the beggar didn't want, says as a provocation, as is his want. He says, well, maybe the beggar didn't want a, a, a cloak. Maybe the beggar wanted to be fucked. Uh, which is to say, and this is how, how Van, uh, Stein Van Hul reads this uh, anecdote, is that our compassion silences the other, right? We assume they want us to help them. And in the same way, Zoom and the technology of Zoom uh, silences others. And, uh, and so that's a, another way to think about how that silence functions in those, uh, in those kind of moments. I love it. And then the other thing that we want to make sure to talk about is the Lacan Salon blog. I had Aloy Steven was on and mm -hmm. he wrote a piece about COVID and David right. Pavon Cuellar also uh, gave a lecture that was the piece that he has on the Lacan Salon about COVID. Yeah, yeah. So we've had, uh, so for, for the Salon blog, we've had, uh, we had about a dozen articles talking about uh, COVID itself. Um, uh, Todd uh, McGowan was in there, Matt Flissvader, uh, Hilda Fernandez. Uh, I wrote a short piece, and so there we had some good work there. And then once you know, once the George Floyd protests started happening at the end of uh, at the end of May, we uh, again thought this would be an opportunity. Um, and in part because you know there is a fraught relation uh, on some people's uh, um, in terms of some people's thoughts between. Uh, Lacan and questions of race or colonialism and so on. Um, and also just to, have, to try to put to the front more voices of, uh, of BIPOC people, black or indigenous or people of color as a way not so much to please explain race to us white people uh, in that kind of obnoxious sort of liberal fashion, but rather to try to create a space for uh, that uh, dialogue to take place. And like I say, we're now gonna have a series of, so um, you know, Robert Bashara had a piece in there um, uh, Alfonso had a, Alfonso Williams had a piece in there. I, uh, I think he's been on your show as well, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, he's uh, really great out of uh, Cleveland. His theory and analysis on all the social media platforms, has crazy book collection and T-shirt collection. Um, and uh, you know, Am Johal, Samir Gandesha, uh, Gautam Baku Thasher is is uh, writing something for us right now as well. And then we're gonna have a new series on the blog uh, about teaching and uh, coming out of some of these discussions I'll be having with uh, Cindy and Ed and some other people. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's an exciting moment in terms of people thinking about um, uh, uh, this, thinking about these political and social and, you know, medical, I guess, kind of uh, conditions. Um, and I guess the two things I wanted to finish up with, one was, uh, 
there's a book that Paul Kingsbury and I are co-editing that's coming out from Paul Grave uh, next year uh, called Lacan and the Environment. Um, and uh, because we were just finishing it over the summer, uh, it was suggested we add, we add an afterword about uh, the pandemic. And the two things we talked about in there was on the one hand, when all of a sudden, you know, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, you had these images of, you know, dolphins in the canals in, in Venice, or all of a sudden in, uh, in India, you could see uh, the Himalayas in, because the smog wasn't there, deer wandering through cities and so on. And of course, this is uh, very much, uh, on the one hand, an example of the imaginary that this, uh, this makes up for hundreds of years of pollution and so on, just a, a few weeks of, of, of clean air. Uh, but we also were, were interested in, in that overlap between uh, COVID skeptics and uh, climate skeptics or climate change deniers. The ways in which, again, it's about not trusting science. Uh, and again, it's, it's the sort of notion of, of uh, well, I don't see anyone, I don't know anyone who died. So really, is COVID really a thing or is it just the media talking about it and so on? So there are these kind of interesting overlaps. Um, and I guess the final thing, and then this came out of Robert Bashara's talk at Sao Paulo uh, online on Monday. He had this great, he, he dropped this amazing bomb where he said that Islamophobia and Islamophilia are both racism. And that was just like, you know, the, you, you could just see like the internet exploding because it's like, you're like, what? No, if you like Islamic people, then you're not a racist. And, he's, and he gave this great example of Bill Clinton who once said, you know, we love Muslims, don't be terrorists. Um, or, you know, you think back to Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing where he, uh, you know, Mookie confronts his white friends and he said, you, you love all these black athletes, but you don't like black people. Um, so that, again, it's that ambivalence that they're talking about there, right? Which is uh, embedded in the, uh, in the DNA of the internet, of the digital. You know, we either love something or we hate something. Either you're canceled or you're the most important uh, person at all. And it's also how we function in a libidinal fashion is that we love and hate are inextricably intertwined. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Professor Clint Burnham. For more, check out his book, Does the Internet Have an Unconscious?, as well as his other books through Bloomsbury. And follow the Lacan Salon on Instagram. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair.net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious.org Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Memories, Pandragine, with other individuals, come into, to, and explores the dilemma all when we're of the species, existential fears, the meaning, transitional mind for serving as a political. Governors are dropping shows between head that was. Would it be who led this? Ourselves think this as below, so above. I want 
eating out, baptizing meat, associated with a bonfire blazing. However, ripping molds and the body self of Christ or a scab. Out wild, only child, worked over in the mind. Situations were primary, creating by breaking. For in all only, play, rest, pleasure, memories, tangerine, with other individuals, come into, to, and explore the dilemma all when we species, existential fears, the meaning, transitional mind, for serving as a political. Governors are dropping shows between heads that was. Would it be who led this? Ourselves think this as below, so above. I want eating out, baptizing meat associated with a bonfire blazing. However, ripping molds and the body self, a crust or a scab. Out wild, only child, worked over in the mind. Situations primary, creating by breaking. For in all only, play, wrist, pleasure, nor brutality of war. Don't muse by structure of the privileged. When exercises over, that she was grief. It is the start of the show, roused him. She, nevertheless, he had a celestial over it twice as they sparked an element of, and they were soon, and we lay in the, and we touched the.